Hi, good evening everyone. Um, a good crowd turned out. Uh, thank you all for joining. We're going to be doing a refresher on security labels so that in, when we do the main session on Thursday, we're all on the same page. Over to you, Dennis. So yeah, so, so what we want to do is, um, so on this session, we, we want to kind of go through this idea of security labels and um, which is something that's been around for a while. And then we want to sort of start to think about how it can be applied from a threat modeling point of view and also from the session that we want to run on Thursday uh, about the shrimps to sort of, you know, big sort of uh, issue that, you know, there's a lot of interesting implications. And we kind of thought about, you know, one of the ways to skin that uh, problem is to actually try to, to rationalize, you know, the, the scenarios in the kind of a, a labeling system, right? And um, um, so let, let's kind of go through it. And, and what I started talking to, so we got David here and, and Adam, uh, who, who also going to, to do a lot of contributions. I'm not sure if James has popped in, uh, but actually, you know, a quick introduction. So I'm Dennis Cruz, I'm the CISO and CTO of Glasswall, done a lot of stuff in open source and actually one of the uh, drivers of Open Security Summit. Um, David, quick intro from you. Yeah, David Clark, I've got a background in cybersecurity and data protection. Uh, at one time I was responsible uh, for the design and security of the world's largest private trading network, trading three and a half trillion dollars a day. And I've managed some global security operation centers for a while and recently be doing a, a lot on kind of cyber and data protection as it's uh, data protection is actually kind of caught on now. Cool, Adam, quick one. Hey everybody, I'm Adam Leon Smith. I'm a Chief Technology Officer of a uh, consultancy uh, across London and Spain. I'm also a director of a not-for-profit called For Humanity, which is all about um, the security as well as other aspects of, of AI systems. And I'm very active in the British Computer Society, uh, who will be doing the Thursday session jointly with. Great. James, I think you're around, right? That's him hitting the... You're on mute. Too many mute buttons. Uh, James Bohr, I'm a cybersecurity person. I do bits and pieces. Most relevant to this, I do quite a lot on threat modeling, whether it's training or research into it. Brilliant. Cool. So it's actually quite interesting because you can actually see that we actually have some nice, you know, cross balance, right? And, and if everybody else, if you, if you have ideas or, or put on the chat or, or, or chip in, right? So let's just quickly just take a look at the, in preparation for the, for the session uh, that we're going to have, uh, actually, that I could, that is wrong. Sorry, the, this is this is the one, right? So, um, so the session we're going to have um, on on Thursday, which is this one here, security labels and shrimps too, and, and this is sort of the the example that we want to to go at here today, and um, and kind of I want to go back to a presentation that if you haven't seen by Jeff Williams from 2012, which is which is also an interesting example of you know sometimes good ideas don't just happen, right? I think it's it's a, it's a great example of an idea that makes a lot of sense. It clicks a lot, but sometimes without a couple of individuals or a couple of efforts that, you know, uh, occur, you know, the, the idea just dies, right? Or, or just doesn't fulfill its potential. But I think the way Jeff thought about this initially, I think is really, really spot on, right? So I was just gonna borrow a number of his slides, right? So this is all the credit goes to Jeff on this one. But I think the idea here is that we know labels work, right? You know, we use labels every day. We, we see them, you know, it's, it's a great way to visually represent complex data, right? So, you know, now in my world, everything is a graph, right? And now maps, right? And labels are a great pyramid, right? Or let's say that the top layers of, mm -hmm. of a graph, right? So, and in fact, you know, labels work when every item on the label is hyperlinked to more data, is connected to more entities. So eventually you, you basically have this ecosystem where as you get changes, how you make you know, something happen at the bottom of the pyramid, it reflects all the way to the top, and then you, you're allowed to start changing behaviors. You're allowed to, you know, influence how things work, right? Um, you know, what is actually fundamentally is about allowing users to make choices, right? And, and users here can actually be consumers, can be developers, can be, you know, CISOs, can be regulators, can be the customers, right? And, um, and I think it's interesting that, you know, it, it sometimes, 
you know, a, a label can have, you know, certain side effects. So I think, you know, on M, you know, Eminem, the fact that he has parent advisor actually gets him more sales, right? Then he didn't have the label, right? But that's okay, right? I think it's important to understand that every label will have unintended or intended consequences and maybe some unintended consequences. I think I would argue the idea is for, for the, the entities helping to define the labels, for them to almost understand and drive those unintended consequences, right? So that you know you get a better a better view of what's going to happen, and you and you focus on the core objective, right? Which in in our case, for example, is to improve privacy, right? Our our core objective, I would argue that, especially with the security labels and the conversation we're going to have a bit later on, the the objective should be to try to improve the privacy of of what's going on. And and for the for the members of my team that are here, I I think that labels are a great way to represent and measure and visualize a lot of the stuff that we do, not just for security, but I think security can be a, a massive driver in pushing that because security needs almost those labels and needs that rational way to explain why we're doing this, why we don't do this, right? A very simple example, we're now doing a big push to you know, automate the creation of secure builds for Linux distributions in our containers, in our environment, you, know, you almost want a label that can get, be given to each uh, of the projects and, and each project should have a set of, of labels that we can now measure and visualize what's happening on it, right? And, uh, and the other thing that labels has is it forces you to think about, you know, what is the message that you want to pass on, right? So the, 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 the place, of course, that it really makes a massive difference and, is, and sometimes is life or death kind of situation is in, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, right? Where, you know, it, you know, it makes a massive difference on the ingredients. It makes a massive difference on, on who can use it, when you can use it, how you can use it, right? And I think there's a lot of stuff that we can learn from here, because this industry has been doing it for a long time, right? In fact, you know, we should be getting people from those industries to come to our industry to help to actually make this happen. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting is that labels will affect user behaviors, right? And again, I don't think you should shy from it and you should not shy from the fact that a lot of players don't like labels because labels force a certain type of rationalization or visibility that especially I would argue on the software security industry is still very uncommon. Right, so I think that we we I think we have a duty to change how our industry works because our industry you know has very little visibility. Right, in fact, there's a great article that was that a document that was published recently that I wanted to to put here, which is about talking about security industry as a market for, for lemons, which I actually think in, in most cases is quite correct. Um, the link from that Jeff uh, article that was this really cool, uh, basically old uh, document, but it, it's really interesting because it talks about the economics of full labeling, right? And talks about the implications and how it works and, and the mandatory parts and when he's not mandatory and who does it and when he does it, right? And, and actually it has a nice you know, a presentation on how does it happen? What do you need? And you can see that you kind of need standards, you need testing, accreditation, you know, and then certification and enforcement. And that's kind of, you know, and it's private and, 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 and government, right? I, you know, and I think, you know, I will almost say there's open, right? And I think we, the, the best way for us to create a standard that makes sense that governments can push is to create one that has wide adoption. So make it easy for governments to push it down. And, you know, organizations like the BSI and other organizations to push down and say, this is something that we, you know, we, we subscribe to. What is really, I think, shocking on this, although you shouldn't be surprised, or this is just a, an interesting um, uh, kind of, uh, bit about the dolphins, right? The, a particular standard that um, um, you know occurs. Sorry, and um, and basically what what you got here, which I think is is shocking, but you know, is the fact that if you look at what you had in this case, you could see the the deaths from literally half a million, hundred thousand, twenty eight thousand to five thousand, and and in a way it took deaths to force, in this case, action, right? So you can see that it's only when we start to realize that we're losing, you know, we're killing a lot of dolphins, that there was now a protection act, then a consumer boycott of tuna, very important. The tuna producers introduced adult friendly. So you can start to see the, the impact of the consumer in driving behavior, right? Now, the, the, I think the key question here is that we shouldn't wait for deaths, right, to do action. And I think the software industry has kind of been guilty of that because sometimes 
you know, the externalities of who's actually paying for the problem tends to be a little bit far away and we don't measure that very well, which actually means that sometimes there isn't a direct correlation and there's no, it's not as terminal sometimes as an accident or a death, right? But I think we're now getting to the point where we now know that privacy problems have a huge amount of impacts in society, right? Have a huge amount of impact in how we live. I don't think we should be waiting for, you know, the next generation of massive problems to be doing something about it, right? But sometimes that's what it takes. So here's kind of the idea, right? The idea is that, you know, you want to put some labels between the producers and the consumers, between the users and the developers and, and, and the websites and whoever, you know, creates a service that is used by the consumers. You want to start to understand the ingredients, but also like, you know, something like this, right? You know, what's the expectation? What's the vulnerabilities that exists? What do you got in there? What's the, you know, do you have authentication? You have access controls, you put validation, all that stuff, right? And this is super powerful because it allows you to start understand what are the side effects of this. So one of the things I always tell my team is that we have to be super transparent with the vulnerabilities that we have so that we allow the end user to make a good decision. So it's okay to say that there's no authentication in this software. It's okay to say that authorization is security theater. It's almost a usability feature, right? It's just there to make sure that users don't see stuff from other users, but there is no real meat, right? Let's say it's broken, you know, it's not properly enforced because it's the, maybe it's the first version or it hasn't been a priority. My view is it's okay as long as that is made aware to the end users or the, the people implementing it so they don't put that application in a place where that is important. Right, and every application will have vulnerabilities. The only question is where do you start measuring it? So I think the software facts and, and security facts will allow us to start to create and think about standards and start thinking about how we should do this. So, and this is, so, you know, Adam and, and David and James talking about the, the areas, you can see that what, what you need for labels is almost like you need this kind of top level items that you're measuring, you know, in this case, custom code, libraries, platform, interfaces, sensitive data. And then that next layer down where you can start to, you know, go into detail of what that is. And then there's kind of needs to be a formula that gets you to that sort of top level, high, medium, low, A, B, C, A to F, you know, some kind of metric, right? For, for how to do this. And then, you know, just, just a, a the extension. So in 2012, Jeff published that. 2014, um, you know, these guys picked up this, which was again, it's a cool project. Uh, unfortunately, again, not a lot has happened from it, but again, the thinking has evolved a little bit. We're thinking about the labeling system. We need to attract, you know, a good thing, trans transnational solutions, security is invisible, right? You know, let's, let's make a good, a good pass at this, right? And, um, and there's a cool project, although it's, it hasn't moved a lot beyond. You kind of start to think about these four areas of security, privacy, ingredients, and openness. And each of these will kind of get a label, right? So this is, again, is that idea that and we shouldn't shy away from this, right? That we want to give a label, good or bad, to the participants. And now, one thing I would add, which I think was the mistake that these guys did, is that we should do a mode where it doesn't depend on the other side to participate. And I, I think this is a really important concept here, right? Whatever labeling system we create, you know, it has to be almost smart, right? Simple, measurable, actionable, you know, whatever the rest is, right? And, um, but it has to be done in a way that the, the participants that wanna participate, of course, right? And I'll, I'll, I'm gonna probably most likely throw glass wall to the ring, right? To the hat, right? I think we, we wanna be involved in some of this where, where relevant, right? But you know, it shouldn't depend on the vendors or the players or the service providers to be involved, right? Because that's the problem that these guys had. These guys did a great job, great thinking, you know, really well thought out for how to do an IoT security, but it, it was abandoned, well, abandoned. It had to pause, stop, I think a couple of months ago, three to five months ago, right? And, and, and part of the reason why is he didn't have industry adoption. And you kind of see why not, right? Because if the industry mostly, you know, is not in a good position, right? I, I don't think that they're going to, you know, it's almost like you have a tragedy of the commons, right? You have a, you have a problem where nobody wants to be the first two or the first five, right? Because they will stand out. And the ones who don't play almost stand out better because 
they're not being evaluated. So I think it's very important that we come up with a solution that, you know, and I think this is a great design, right? If you think about this, you know, they, they're thinking about it. You could see data practices, security, you know, information, they, you know, all, all this stuff is really cool, right? And, and it starts to go to the level of detail that we need to go because, you know, it's a complex problem, right? But we, we need to find, we need to do this in a way that it doesn't depend on the other side to actually um, dance. So that means we can start to pick a particular scenario, start to do lots of mappings and almost let the consumers or the ones that have the use cases um, come along and, and, then, and then talk about it. Now, before we go into the COVID ones, you guys want to add some comments? I have two comments, but they're lighthearted. So this one, this might become, this might get um, more attraction if some legislation was to use it in its um, structure. That's my first comment. And the second one, I was expecting the CIA triad and I didn't see it, so so disappointing. That's an interesting one. Yeah, no, that, that could be added, right? That's not. Well, that, that might be too. I think the, the other thing, some of these things in reality are layered. So actually you kind of need one thing like, um, I'm, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, you kind of need the, the OWASP testing to kind of be in place before you can really say that the privacy bit works. Because if the first bit works, doesn't work, you've really got no chance of really saying that you're doing anything about privacy. So they, they kind of tend to be linked. But that's why yeah. it has worked. So, you, you know, you need to go for two labels effectively rather than one label. Well, one label kind of gets you, you your foot in the door and the other label gets you operational kind of thing. Yeah, but I, 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 the, my only concern with that one, right, is that, you know, if you, if you raise the bar to say, we need to have a good standard for how to measure web app security, right, or security mm -hmm. of systems, right, you, you know, you, you're joining a massive <laughs> long... Yeah, yeah, and, and there's no... And what's the problem with that? That's happened in every industry since kind of the 1800s you know, car industry, plane industry, um, you know, everyone goes, yeah, it's a massive barrier to en entry. But, you know, in 1926 in the US, you had to build a plane to a certain standard because kind of people were getting killed and injured. Um, cars in the 70s, Ralph Nader, he said, you know, massive campaign to make cars safe. And, you know, yeah, it's a big barrier. You, you cannot make a car now, kind of a couple of bits of iron and a bit of welding and a wood. You know, you, didn't, you could do that in the 1930s, but it's not acceptable today. And I think we're, we're kind of at that stage with technology. It's, it's kind of needs much more kind of regulation. It is mm. going to be a higher barrier to ent entry. Um, you know, that, that's the world we've created for ourselves. I think you know, there's you... also, uh, sorry, there's also risks around labeling if things aren't done in a standardized way. I've seen uh, people attempt to create AI ethics labels which boils down some really complex philosophical uh, constructs into something as simple as uh, the energy efficiency of your home sort of diagram with red and, and classes like A, B, C, and D and stuff. So I think it's really important that agreed standards are used commonly by, by all. And we, and we have that this kind of, I, I guess, challenge, you know, go back to cars. In the UK, you have to have something, you know, once your car gets to a certain age, you have to have something that's called an MOT, where you take it to a garage and they kind of check the lights work and the brakes work. Does it mean that your car is safe? Not really, because it also depends on the driver behind the wheel, you know, uh, and who manages them. And no amount of MOT testing will kind of make, make a driver safe. You but know, then why we, do you have MOT? You have an OT to make the car safe so that the driver can then be regulated. And that's kind of the same thing with software. You need a baseline, like the security bit in place that's kind of like the MOT, yeah, the structure's there, blah, 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 blah. And then you need the bit that controls the kind of human component of it. Because th th there's nothing to stop you driving on the wrong side of the road. If you want to do it, you can do it. Okay, you might get arrested sooner or later, but you actually can do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing to stop you. And, th and that's, that's the challenge you have in software. There's nothing to stop you doing whatever you want. Yeah, but it's the same thing with, like you said, driving, right? I can drive. On... Absolutely, absolutely. But, but there is a different type of regulation to control the human system. 
you know, speed cameras, police, people in the street, you know, you don't drive on the pavement, all this kind of stuff. There, there's all these rules around cars that aren't part of the car. Yeah. And it's the, same, it's, it's the same with software. Well, there isn't in, in software. There's no rules. For there, there is nothing. There is nothing in software. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, I mean, OWASP, you know, for a long while, I've got to admit, I kind of didn't kind of think too much of it. And then the more companies I come across and they just fail on OWASP within minutes of getting a pen test. You know, it's astonishing that, you know, developers are not building this in. And, and maybe that's where it needs to go. I mean, what my son's doing A-level computing, yeah, there's almost a page in his A-level textbook on privacy. You know, great. So, you know, the next generation don't really kind of know what's expected of them other than delivering kind of flashing lights and cool tech. We know we can do that. We've been able to do this for a long time to deliver cool stuff, but can we deliver it kind of safely, appropriately and kind of fairly? There is laws on data though, which I guess is why we're here. Yeah. And that's, that's European, what it comes down to. <laughs> the, the European Parliament proposed, I think, last week, or passed a resolution putting forward a draft text for legislation specifically about AI and it causing harm to people in, in society, which, if it passes unaltered, which I'm sure it won't, would allow people to sue the providers of AI systems for up to two million each euros, I assume, which is a step in the right direction. But I think it's interesting, for example, mm. like, the things you, you, you mentioned, David, uh, is almost familiar. I, I've heard that, you know, many times before, right? I think the, in fact, when, I remember when this, when the first time we, you know, we talk about this, right? In 2012, right? The, and even before that, right? You can, I, I, I'm pretty sure you can go back all the way to the eighties and there's people saying software is out of control. You know, it's now super critical, you know, lives are depending on it. You know, we don't fully understand it. There's no way to measure it. Mm. And, you know, we need this, right? So I, I think, you know, the, the, it's very easy now to get and reach a consensus that this is important, right? Mm. I think it's important to learn from the past and ask why hasn't it worked? I guess we're waiting for all the scatter systems well, to start I, 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 everything. Yeah, and, and I think unfortunately we're kind of waiting for regulation. You know, the same thing has happened in the building world. You know, one time you could build anything you like and it could look like anything you like. Now you have to have, you know, in the UK, you have building control that makes sure the building is safe and then it has to fit with planning. So it kind of blends in with the local environment. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of two concepts. It's very rare we come across an unsafe building, you know, really, really rare. But in the good old days, that was just really common because, because it wasn't regulated. And when I've kind of been a... a kind of meetings and I won't kind of name any of the companies there, but you'll have heard of every single one of them. No one wants to be the first mover because they know if they're the first mover alone, they will be losing revenue from somewhere or other and probably a huge amount of revenue, which is why unfortunately, I think it's gotta be, it's gotta come from regulation. And generally regulation as a rule has expanded markets, not shrunk markets. Oh yeah, absolutely, right? I, I, I agree with you, right? I think there's, you know, if you get this right, you know, regulation will actually improve in, in, in this case actually will increase innovation right? uh, i mean one, one sorry one, one of the things I, I, I can't kind of read all the details on the um iot one but i think the, the one thing also is the metadata of the data yeah. and i think that is seriously overlooked um you know wars have been won on metadata uh, rather than the content you know second yeah. world war it wasn't about cracking the encryption that was a good part but the real part was actually the the metadata around the encryption and, and when I, I although I'm, I'm kind of my wife won't let me go to the school meetings anymore but when I kind of ask the school what they do with the metadata of the intranet yeah they have no idea you know yeah. because you have all this great data and you can profile kids when they're young are they going to become dustmen or prime ministers and should you insure them in the future the, the, there's no kind of real control about the, of the metadata and who owns it uh, and it's really difficult to say who owns the metadata about your kid's usage of the internet, even just logging on and logging off. Yeah, and, but I, and, I, and that's where I feel that, you know, when we talk about labels, for example, mm. I, I feel that labels are a way to create gamification, right? That will almost reward the right behaviors to be done, right? And, 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 that's, and that's why it's important to say, like, if we don't have anything today that is it's very good. But by the way, we, we do have, right? We do have things like several essentials and, and, and a couple of other standards and, and ISOs and stuff like that. And, and they have added, added a lot. I feel that what we almost want to have in the next maybe decade is an explosion, right? Of labels, an explosion of trying to figure this out until 
you know, almost patterns emerge, and then we can start to normalize them a little bit. But I, I, I totally agree with you, but, uh, but I think the reality is the ones that have worked have been dependent on regulation. I mean, I don't know about you guys, yeah, but unless it was legal to wear a seatbelt, I probably wouldn't. Um, seatbelts drive me around the bend. Um, but seatbelts have worked because it's been mandatory, you know, and we've got standards like ISO and all that. And they're kind of from the old days where you had to kind of do huge amount of risk analysis to kind of prove a point to people who didn't really want to listen anyway, yeah, to say that this is dangerous. Whereas if it was kind of mandated, for example, multi-factor authentication, it's quite probability that would reduce a lot of breaches straight away just because it was mandated and it was regulated. Um, probably not the best example, but there is very little that is kind of actually mandated other than, you know, and we all know risk, you know, we, we could all sit on a risk committee and all have 45 different views each on the same thing. And I, I know I could, I could argue every case backwards. Um, but once it's regulated, it, it kind of changes it. So I mentioned at the start, I'm part of a, a not-for-profit uh, called For Humanity. One thing we've been doing to try and accelerate regulation, again, specifically in AI systems, but we are looking at other areas, is looking at GDPR certification schemes. So whilst these don't exist yet, it is possible for the Information Commissioner to approve a certification scheme, and I think it has to be approved by the UK Accreditation Service as well, so that bodies can then give labels to AI systems after they've been audited, which offers some, and David might know more about this, some degree of protection that they have, they have done best efforts towards trying to uh, make sure that their processing is lawful. Oh, um, which... absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's moving in the right direction. You know, there, there is a kind of couple of projects I'm working on along those lines. And, you know, it, it does get really complex. And I, I'm, I'm not kind of sure even the regulator kind of understands sometimes how complex this can be in, in a real world environment. You know, no one has the perfect scenario. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then look, I, I think the, the, the thing about this, right, is, is to nudge, right? Like we, it is, I think sometimes in security, I think we, we, we do this mistake of looking at a problem, right? And then finding 20 different things that are wrong with it, right? And, mm. and almost mm. like, you know, raise the problem or the solution to a, yeah. an impossible level of, 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 of deliver, deliverability, right? Where actually, you know, we need, we need to look at what are the things that actually will move the needle, right? And if you move the needle, right, even if you rewards good behavior, if you move the needles for some elements, what you're doing is you're raising the bar, right? And, and yeah. I would say that when you talk about, you know, the seat belts and 2FA, I think we are before that. Like, we don't even know what that looks like, right, in some of these things. Or when we do, we don't have a good way to measure it, right? And what I like about labels is that, you know, there's already a lot of great solutions mm. that we should start to say, who does this should be rewarded, but you need a good way to capture it, right? You need a, you need a good Absolutely. way. Absolutely, Absolutely, yeah. You know, a, a kind of a consensus from the industry can yeah. come and say, we think these five things are really important. We think that these 10 things are really important, right? From a privacy point of view, from, a, from this solution point of view. And if you can measure it, you know, you know and if somebody lies, I think that's that's okay, right? Because eventually they're going to be caught, right? And and there's already, you know, you know, and you know, an understanding that if you, you know, for, even from a legal point of view, you know, it's much easier not to say anything, right? Because once you have to say something, right, it becomes, in a way, there starts to be a track record, right? So so the irony is that even if it's a voluntary scheme, right, or or a mapping, right, once you have enough of those, you know, the the company will start. Yeah. Thing. And eventually, then it's easy for somebody to say, I don't know, this is regulation, right? But until you've got the formula, right, you know, you, at the moment, we're making it really hard for somebody to come up with a regulation, because even we as an industry can, can't do it. I agree. Yeah. So, um, Adam, do you want to just quickly um, mention the scenario that we want to cover? And then, mm. then yes. those examples from the COVID app that we looked in last summit, um, then we start to get a sense for maybe the, the big sense of gravity that we should be looking at. So my first use case I'm thinking about is email. Um, so like many companies, I use a cloud-based email provider. Uh, probably use the same one as many of you. Um, and I don't run my own internal email servers. Now, 
I guess I have all sorts of information floating around on email. I have personal data. I probably have data that might be considered sensitive, for instance, um, you know, things like people's passports, right? Copies of people's passports. I also have uh, cloud infrastructure. So I have some servers with one of the big cloud providers. I manage those servers myself. I have all the right security protection around them. But again, I you know, have bits and pieces of, of data, mostly about employees uh, that I want to make sure is kept private in a, a lawful manner. Yeah, cool. But I think there are two, right? So you got you got the email, which is a complete cloud, mm -hmm. and then you got the cloud infrastructure, which is, you know, which is where you you are in a way you you you're running on top of other you know other systems, right? That's right. Yeah. So, so software so the, as a service the, and infrastructure as a service. The, the the kind of the kind of real one of the real challenges now is kind of email. Um, I'm trying to think. Maybe kind of ten years ago, I don't know whether you guys had it. Yeah, everywhere you work, they limited you to 250 meg of storage or something, and you had to kind of clear your email down. So, kind of email, you know, it was a risk, but it wasn't such a big risk. Now, everybody, and probably mine as well, it's now a transmission method and a storage method. Uh, method, method. So you kind of store stuff in email and use it for transmission, and and really from a data protection point of view, they kind of don't go well together because how on earth do you do that? So if you look at my email, there'll be personal data that I have for business, you know, CVs, my own data or passports or whatever. And then there might be me potentially using company facilities to book where I get my hair done or buy clothes or whatever, which is kind of, would kind of classify say as personal, personal data. Um, as a company, you probably don't really want to know that I'm booking my hair or going out for tea with somebody or whatever, but, as a company, you have the right to look at this data and you may need to kind of use it for different purposes. So it's how do you kind of classify that? Yeah, there are kind of plenty of tools that you could use to do that, but is it is it kind of workable and do you need an army of 500 people to make it work? Um, you know, some companies I've seen, and this was a while ago, yeah, they, they had a kind of great policy that email was 30 days, otherwise it was deleted. It's pretty vicious, probably, kind of reduce most people to a non-functional wreck because it kind of certainly would for me. But the idea was is that if ever they were going to be sued or there was a discovery action, um, they could quite happily say it wasn't in the last 30 days, we're not even going to look for it for you because it will have been deleted. Um, so, so maybe it kind of comes down to the tools we're using are not totally fit for purpose for the, for, for the environment we work in. They're, they've kind of been radically enhanced, but they're really like a 70s concept that's kind of grown very sophisticated, but not moved with the times. Uh, you know, if you look at every single breach report, what, what's the common factor in every single breach report? 94%, 93% is human error. If you did that in a car or a plane, you'd be going, I kind of think the plane designer didn't get this right. I think the car designer didn't get it right. But we're quite happy to, to kind of blame everything on our users for not being educated enough, not enough training. And you know, we've all been around long enough and I think all of us and probably many of the people who work, they've had decades of training on cybersecurity and it doesn't really seem to make a huge amount of difference or maybe it does make a difference, but the figures are still the same, which kind of shows the technology is not helping us. Um, so it, it, is it more You're of right. a ground routing? You're right. And looking at the slide that's up there, looking at all of that stuff under the categories of personal data, almost all of that could be floating around in my inbox or archive absolutely, absolutely. yeah yeah the unstructured data the unstructured data of many different types hmm. yeah, and actually you know and, and this is where i feel that you know part, part of what we should try and do here is also not reinvent the wheel right because if you look at a lot of for example gdpr right and i actually think gdpr there's some really great concepts on it right when you oh, talk about yeah, absolutely. Data minimization you know the rights of the individuals right and, and that's the kind of stuff that we kind of want to capture here, right? So, mm. and, and, I, and if you look at, for example, a label for the email system that um, you know, Adam was mentioning, right? Um, I, I think it has to take into account the difference between the day one, right, of, of your email system, right? And day 100 that maybe has a couple of these ones and day 1000 that has most of them, right? Because almost the security controls and the security requirements and, you know, uh, the things that you want to do, 
you know, make a difference, right? Because it's all about risk to the individuals, right? It's all about the, you know, the security measures, the discipline they want to have in, in play. Like, you know, David was saying, you know, a, a great practice, right? Get rid of data, right? If you get rid of data that is toxic, right? Then, you know, you don't have that problem. The problem is, I think, if those lines get crossed without you realizing it. So oh, it, it's really easy. And, and, and email, how do you delete data in email? You know, you could be using kind of other devices, systems in front of your email to protect you. It's stored there as well. It becomes quite a, an onerous task to say, I've actually deleted this data. And then what's the standard for deleting data in different cloud systems? It's going to vary. Um, it, it's, it's quite complex. It is, but it's the reality, right? Yeah, reality. yeah, it's reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but we, we, we need... It's also a technology use case that applies to every, well, I imagine nearly every SME that does anything, right? I mean, it, it just applies to so many mm. of us that we have this kind of data <coughs> risk. Yeah, but, but you see, like, look, uh, if, if I'm speaking as a CISO, right, I don't have good levers, right, to promote good behavior in the organization, right? I, I don't get good visibility on the moments where the HR team suddenly creates a massive, you know, data silo over there because they're using a new recruitment tool, right? And not to say that I would want to, you know, prevent that, mm. but I would want to have certain controls in place, right? I want to make sure that, for example, the questions that we're asking here, right, are now taken into account. But I, I don't have a good way to even very quickly measure the risk of that behavior, the risk of a developer team that now you know, is pushing to production certain things. You know, the risk of a finance team that now, you know, is doing a certain type of transaction, right? And using Excel, not my current example, right? Using Excel, uh, you know, files to send financial transactions between two entities, right? Or to have, you know, like, like the Greek guys, right? That have a spreadsheet that control half the debt of the company, right? And make a mistake in one number, right? <laughs> or more recently, the COVID app guys, right? Who basically using a version of Excel that has that. Like, you know, if you think about it, like if you look at those examples, we need a visual way to represent when those lines are crossed, right? And, and when does the requirements become, you know, should go up versus down, right? But, but are we kind of looking at this too late, kind of down the path? Because really it needs to be kind of at the design level rather than the operational level. I you know, there's no, no point making the wheels round on a square car when it's kind of too late. You kind of should have done that at design yeah. stage. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say this is threat modeling. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all in the design. If you're not catching it at design, you can't fix it. Yeah, but this is, so I need to find a word to describe this, right? See if you guys can help me, right? I, I would argue that that doing that design is a natural evolution of the practices, right? Like in a way it's, we can, we absolutely, we all can agree that doing the, the sooner you do it, right? The better it is, right? That's absolutely. The problem is you need a level of maturity right, in the system for that to be possible, right? A, a good example is in development, right? If you don't have a team that starts from scratch with a full CI pipeline, with a full way to visualize what they're doing, a way to document what's happening, a way to map everything out, right? That even if you try to do a thread model in the beginning, right, you're doing a thread model on their understanding of how it works. Right. Yeah, but that's that's the problem. Security should not be doing the threat model. Oh yeah, of course. But that, and that's again, that's a natural evolution, right? Mm. When the threat modeling practices evolve in organization, or the security labeling practices evolve, right? And I and I actually think that the security label can give something to the threat modeling that is missing. Mm. The same way that the mapping, the worldly maps, give context to threat modeling. I think security labels can allow, you know, for example, like I've done this party trick where I'll do three thread models, right? Um, for, for the same application, right? For different implementations, right? You know, they do and then go, look, model A has this amount of risks, model B this, model C this. Now, hey, pick one, right? <laughs> and, and usually the, the first one has a lot of user restrictions. The third one might be very good from a usability point of view, but the risks now outweigh the advantages, right? And you start to really question why do you want this and that and that feature where 
actually the risk is too high. So I think labels can allow us to rationalize the threat model, you know, knowing that eventually the teams would do it, right? You know, the, the sooner they do it, the better. But the problem is we don't even have anything. So again, let's look at history, right? Where did it all start? It started with pen tests, right? That's where it started. And, and, and pen test is what? It's, it's breaking shit, right? It's finding vulnerabilities. It's having unrefutable proof that this is a problem. Right? So there was not theoretical, uh, you know, the whole thing. Well, well, well I think you make, you've, you've hit the nail on the head that the primary reason computers were invented was for hacking. There is kind of no two ways about it. Yeah, yeah. That, that was their main role. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they have other uses, but their primary use was for discovering information that would be useful. Yeah, but, so, but I was actually approaching more from the point of view of a lot of the security industry, the mature security industry, the DevOps push left, it all started with hacking, right? Look, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm old enough and remember that most of the security industry was just about, you know, breaking into stuff, right? Because that's where the market was. That's what paid. But also that's where it made sense because that's where you get the biggest, you know, value for money, right? Well, I, well it's, kind of, it's kind of what won the Second World War, hacking at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. Look, I, I remember being paid literally by a global bank to, to scan the world to find their assets, right? And, and, and then I think your labeling concept, you know, I think that's kind of got a lot of value. I mean, yeah. what I find with, um, you know, when I've talked to some kind of big kind of city companies, the insurance banking, a lot of them, a lot of CISOs go, I want DLP. And I, I love DLP. I think it's kind of some of the coolest stuff. But actually, it's non-functional in many of these places because the business's job is to distribute personal information. Yep. How, do, how do you use DLP to bring your business to its knees? Because it kind of doesn't work unless you have a whole load of laboring and criteria and you can really make it work. Otherwise, all you're, all you're doing is stopping the top secrets going out, which no one kind of cares about anyway. Um, no one's going to get fined. So it's, it's almost as if it's all about the metadata rather than the data. I think that's kind of true. In Just many, to many go cases. right back to the beginning. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think, you know, if, if, if you look at this, right, you know, I, I feel that we, and we need to think about some, something that is easy to implement, easy to measure, you know, you know, take, take Adam's situation, right? You know, we have an email in the cloud provider, right? If you have 10 email systems, right? How, mm. how do you differentiate them? Right, you know, it's like the market, go back to the market for lemons, right? How do we allow the consumer to make a good business decision, right? And in this case, for example, how do we allow even the providers not to be breaking the law, right? So when, when the law, when, when the new ruling and when the new guidance comes along, right, it says, you know, you, you cannot host or it's not safe now or we don't have, not safe, but we don't, you know, the legal requirements and storing data in the U.S., are not mm. the same as starting in the UK or the EU, right? And now you need to have the data there. You know, how do we have something that suddenly it changes from A to B or goes from green to red? So I think I can configure in Office 365 if there's personal data detected by a DLP rule for a, a hint to be given to the user. I've never tried it, but that's the sort of thing where labeling yeah. an individual data item like that can give a hint to uh, a business user that might help them in how they treat that, that data. Yes, you can. You can do everything from a policy hint uh, up to having it approved by a manager to just saying you can't send that. Yeah, and you can do that. I just want to say you can do it. Yeah. So you see, that's a feature, right? So in a way, what you want is if you now have 10 email providers, right, which one gets the check on that box? And now, you know, you start to also reward good behavior because the ones who don't have that, right, um, can now turn around and go, well, we need to add that feature, right? And, and then I think you've yeah. kind of got business functionality. Uh, I, I was talking to a company a couple of years ago and one of their problems was sending the right email to the wrong person. Yeah. So they, they were going to remove the autofill uh, thing. So you had to type it in manually trouble is that if you do a kind of work study and you realize that you know you're saving thousands of pounds of man hours by having autofill put in place and actually is is the kind of risk benefit that worth it because you could still type in the wrong email address it's just 
autofill makes it sometimes a little bit easier. Well, um, so, so, you know, so, sometimes the kind of solution, I'm not sure kind of works having five people verify an email. Um, doesn't but going make sense. back, going back to that, um, just office 365 for example, if you've got that sort of labeling in place, you can have approved recipients and non approved recipients. If you've put the wrong one in, it doesn't mm. go to them. Now, you'd only want to do that for sensitive data unless you had very comprehensive labeling, but you don't have to start with a perfect granular down to a grain of sand labeling scheme. Yeah. You can start with, we care about this or we don't, and then you can refine it. It's not something yeah. where you just mm. drop a monolithic solution in and say that fixes the problem. It is something where you can do a continuous improvement as you go. And I think it really has to be that way because it would just grind legal firms, for example, to a halt, trying to say, OK, now we label everything accurately with our 100 item taxonomy. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. That, that sounds, sounds about right. And I think legal firms, unfortunately, they, they kind of end up being an exception because I think we were talking about this a little bit before the call started. There's a bit of a gap between kind of lawyers and understanding the law or understanding technology and they often forget even the basics if i send you a letter in the post paper it's a criminal offense for me to open that letter if you send the letter to my company for one of my staff by email i can look at that email it's not a criminal offense and they often kind of forget that subtlety um that you know where where law applies and where it doesn't apply so yeah i think kind of legal firms need a lot of help with that absolutely well, and, you know, labels are a way to, you know, yeah. Present, yeah. Right? because you yeah. can have, you can, in fact, in your example, you could label the, the, the user journey of a letter, you can label the user journey mm. of an email, right? And you should be able to see, yeah. right? And, and, and what I like about labels fundamentally is that it allows, it allows the flexibility, almost allows the feedback loop and the DevOps cycle where mm. you get to define, for example, the rules of the game, right? So if you're saying that the rules of the game is privacy, it doesn't matter if, for example, an engine has a particular functionality. So let, let's say, for example, the, 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 the example of labeling data that Adam was saying, right? So, and, and this is where it gets interesting because you, you, in one way you can label a piece of technology, binary, do you have the feature, you don't have the feature, but you could also label, is it working, right? And, and, and again, is it working can be measured by number of emails sent to the wrong person, data leakage, all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff, right? So you can basically keep raising the bar, right? And you can start very simple, like do you have this or you don't have this? Oh, 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 oh absolutely. And I think um, uh, James kind of brought up another issue. You know, I've come across companies who have these kind of great ideas that people are not talking to each other enough. So their plan was to measure how many emails people sent to other people in the company and that was going to be used as a measure of either good or bad communication so the kind of less emails you did you might be talking more the more emails you were kind of just you know playing email um i kind of pointed out human rights section eight that maybe they want to be a little bit careful if you're going to measure people like that but you know the, the wrong information can kind of lead to the wrong conclusion you know i remember talking to a cio at the national health service and i kind of said to him from the evidence i have yeah we should shut down all the hospitals. And he goes, why? I said, well, more people die in hospital than any other place. Therefore, the conclusion is let's get rid of it. But that's not the whole story. It's just a component of the story. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of goes back to Edward Deming in the 50s. Yeah, you have to understand the full context to understand the problem. Otherwise, you look at a bit of it, yeah, and you come up with a great solution and actually it's a disaster. So I, I would say my instinct is that we, we will find those metrics. Right? Is is this like sometimes you have to find the features that your 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 customers want? Right? I think yeah. what we need to yeah, yeah, yeah. start doing this: put the line in the sand, let it people complain, let it you know generate a bit of attrition or sorry of of you know of disruption, and then keep refining it. Right? And and if the idea here is that we're going to come up with a version of labels that is going to work for the next five years or ten years that's, you know, there's lots of bodies on the road, right? There's, yeah. That has yeah. failed in the past. I think the idea that you can create a labeling architecture that actually allows companies to even create their own labels, right? And, and, and I, I go back to my, my kind of model of, if it's a graph, it's easy to make transformations, right? So we, we need a model that mm -hmm. individual companies, individual resources can create their own labels. They can create their own reality that makes sense to them. 
And then you have a mode that it rewards it being compatible with the upstream and being compatible with the upstream. So that is a direct path, but everything has to be customizable. And in a way you need to allow the individual players to create labels or systems that are relevant to them to their users. Look, even their, their cultures, right? You know, the way, you know, English, again, it's, it has certain level of subtleties that in other language they don't have, right? So we need to take that into account. So a labeling system has to work, you know, mm -hmm. worldwide. And, it, it, you know, unless these things are measurable mathematically, when you get into context and, and some kind of subjective, you almost need to take a step back and going, what are we trying to do? Agree. And it sounds like that's probably one of the only ways or easiest way to get a scalable solution that's understandable by a lot of people, which is kind of where we want to be. I think you guys are going to end up with an ISO standard for this. Yeah, but, the, but that's the destination, right? Like the destination is, re is, is, is government regulation, right? And I, I agree with, with David that there's a number of things. There's a number of players that would only dance when it becomes regulation, right? And you know, I think this is the path to there, right? And, and that's why, you know, it's always better sometimes the industry to come together and come up with something that works versus regulation being done by individuals who don't understand the industry. Yeah, I, I don't think they will only dance to regulation. I just want to say there is de facto regulation. I know a lot of companies who will apply ISO 27K because their customers demand it and their customers are large enough. Individuals, individual customers, not so much, but the moment you start working with organizations, if you can sell large organizations on it, it does become de facto regulation because you can't do business without it. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, and that's, I don't know if you guys, that's kind of where I've seen a lot of the security and their protection really take effect. It's because the supply chain has demanded it. I think the smallest ISO I've done is a two-man company. And I said to them, what do you want it for? You're kind of two people. But they said, we can't get traction in our market unless we have it. Yep. And, you know, if you'd have asked me that five years ago, I'd have said, definitely don't do it. It's going to be way too expensive. But it, it's become, you know, a currency now. Well, we, we have that problem already, right? Like, you know, with the overhead that we get from third-party, you know, you know render. Yep questionnaires is massive yeah. right yeah it's huge it's huge yeah. that needs, that's a great example of the more that you get labels around it the more that gets normalized right the more that gets scalable the easy in fact the, the easier for everybody right yeah I cool agree. all right so let's let's just quickly look at the stuff that we created for the COVID apps because i think you know maybe what we can do is if for each of the slides we could say which one doesn't apply or maybe which one applies to the scenario of, of the email where, you know, we have, you know, or, or, you know, in a way those two scenarios where we have an email being hosted and you responsible for a bit of infrastructure and, you know, and how do we measure from day zero when there's no data, there's no risk, there's no kind of impact to, you know, day 100 or day 500 where now there's a lot of impact, right? Uh, on it, or or you know, or even the status at the beginning, right? Because you might have systems that are vulnerable from the get go, right? So here's one, right? So so the the, the first one we had was this sort of idea. <laughs> okay, this was for the COVID app. So we, some of these you might need to change the, the the context actually. But the idea was, you know, is there no content? You know, is there consent to be using the the data here, right? No consent, legal consent, explicit and informed, right? And I guess if we go into your scenario, Adam, where do you think you, that you gave informed consent of where, for each of those two scenarios, of where the data is, you know, what's happening, what's the current situation of your infrastructure? Uh, you... I just want to check something on this. Legal consent, how's that different from explicit? generally kind of explicit is normally better documented and mm. you know that that it, it's there's when you actually come to do it technically there's going to be very little difference yeah no it, explicit um, is going to be affirmative consent in some yeah. form and legal consent will probably be similar yeah. i'm just wondering if we need an impl implicit consent in there well, well you, you're not meant to do implicit consent exactly um, but is this actually consent in the first place I would kind of argue this is kind of public task or vital interest because this is meant to kind of save our lives. So why are we asking for permission as a government with a government hat on um, and what they do with the data no longer becomes consent once they've got it anyway. 
so long as they're the using it for those purposes so they say so um the, the the problem is they they potentially are using public tasks for that rather than consent just a note let's not use this for the covid app right yeah. that was just the example we got let's 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 see if it's relevant to the scenario especially with you know uh with the church too right let let's you know think of it from that angle Adam was oh, trying to say something but we couldn't yeah. hear it hopefully my audio is fixed now the uh I was just trying to say, you know, in an employee employer relationship, you know, you, you're not usually gaining explicit consent for someone to use your system to book their hairdressing appointment in the example that in your David contract, gave. usually. You're in the contract. In your contract, but that doesn't count That's as explicit. Use policies and stuff. It's not That's right. Very well, well, a hairdressing appointment is, is a contract and, a, and some of the COVID apps, I haven't looked at them in great detail for a while, but I think some of them kind of tell you what the COVID status is around the area and all this kind of great stuff, kind of implying, actually, I use that, you give me data back, therefore it's an implied contract rather than kind of anything else initially. You know, you give me information and I sign up for it. Um, so I think the kind of legal basis probably varies depending on the circumstances as well. And I think also informed consent, you know, informing them about the risks relating to TREMS2, for instance. You know, I mean, most people don't understand that risk. Um, well, well, the is I don't think it's consent because you have no choice. If I want to send yes. you an email, I've already broken TREMS. Um, so I can't even ask you for consent, strictly speaking, because <laughs> I've broken it by the mere fact I've done it. But, um, okay, but think about it in the medium term, right? If that's true, that's okay. Right, you know, we can just say today that path is broken, right? It might not be in the future. There might be. No, I, I, I agree, but I think, but I think what, what I'm probably really driving everyone insane about is actually legal basis, because I don't, I don't think it's really consent. And I, I guess what's interesting is that this is where I, tomorrow when we do the threat model, I think it's important to map the threat actors, like who are the players that we're talking about here, right? Because. In a way, I guess, Adam, in your case, one of the, the, one of the players that is important, right, or one of the, the actors is important, is your users, right? Yes. I think right. the other thing, a, a property that's very important for labeling, though, I think is more about the type of data. Yeah, and I, I agree with David. I think definitely the legal basis, the lawful basis you're processing under or mm -hmm. that the data is collected and dealt with under is more important than consent because consent is just one of those and let's be honest it's probably the worst one on there that you should hardly ever use and and, and that kind of gets worse you know they, they, there was a lot of kind of talks about when employees come into the office and you should temperature check them and see if they're ill okay and i, and I think the guidance inverted commas was for a company it's legitimate interest because you're doing it in the best interest of the data subject but actually it's kind of really public task and uh, it can't, run, it, can't it can't be public task for a company, though. Oh, yeah, it can be. That, that's an illusion, yeah. I was it, going to say it, it, vital interests. Well, I agree with you, actually. And I've had this argument with loads of lawyers. Aren't we saving lives? Yeah. And they will come out with a million reasons why it's actually not saving a life. Um, and so the, I, I kind of concede to public tasks. But I, I agree. Um, it, 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 vital interests, is, I don't know why, but many kind of um, law firms and data protection lawyers are very nervous about using vital interest, but I, I would agree with you. I think the bottom line it is vital because we're, we're doing it to save lives. That's interesting because I've worked somewhere where CCTV um, was used under the basis of vital interests. Yes. I'm not saving lives with my emails, though. Okay. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if, if your hair gets too long, it might snap your neck, so you need that haircut. So, yeah, 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 it, it is. And I, and I think kind of, I don't know why, a lot a lot of areas, but, but public task kind of makes more sense because actually it's the government helping us to fight this disease. And, and why wouldn't it, if, I, if I'm a company, yeah, and I've got to do a risk base and I'm doing this very, very binary, yeah, with my risk hat on and not taking any kind of sensitivities in, who am I going to target of my staff that I don't want in the office? I'm going to say old people, ill people, certain types of people who are kind of prone, all the stats that do it. And so I will have no one turning up to my office because I'll probably find a really good reason why none of them should come on the tube or come in. And so 
this happened in the US and kind of it, it then turns into something else, which is very, very discriminatory. And really that shouldn't come from a business. If it's going to be like that, it should come from the government under kind of, you know, as you said, vital interest. Or, but or, yeah, if it's, if it's coming from the government though, ideally it should be regulation because if they say temperature check everyone, that's the law, the whole issue goes away. Well, well, actually, I don't think that works either. My, my youngest daughter, she's 18 now. Um, she was just, because, I think after, just before the last, first lockdown, she was going into kind of clubs and pubs where they were taking her temperature. And her and her friend were taken and they were both 35 or 34.9. And they let her in. And I said, if I was that security guard, I'd kick you out. Because at 34.9, 35, you're suffering from hypothermia. God knows what disease you have. It's probably worse than COVID. You can't come in. So are we just saying this is just for one type of illness that we think you've got, or is it for any serious illness that might be spread? And to me, that doesn't make sense. It should either be kind of all or, all or nothing. Mm. Can, I, can I just say something about thermometers? Yeah. Um, as being a doctor and listening to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, right. So basically, um, the thermometers and the way they're used is very, very inaccurate. Um, they're measured on the skin on the head where sometimes you can have a really high temperature just because you're hot. Um, it doesn't reflect your core temperature. Um, also the low temperature, 34.9, again, cold outside, skin is cold. You will seem like you're cold. So this is actually very some, a very, very inaccurate metric that probably I haven't really assessed it so much, but from my perspective, it could cause more damage than good, especially if it's used by all or nothing principle. Um, especially if it's used like, oh, let's just, you know, if it's deranged, let's just kick people out or whatever, you know, exclude them from whatever. Um, I think it needs to be very granular and specific. So for COVID, if we're worried, 38, you know, that's, okay, someone's got a fever, so they shouldn't be there. Um, mm -hmm. That's fair enough. Even though, again, that can be a false positive in many, many times. Like, for example, um, I attended a beach volleyball tournament um, this summer where I turned out that I had a 38.5 temperature when I was measured. Um, but so did 20 other players as well, because it was 35 mm. outside and I was sitting on the sun where my skin wow. got even probably hotter than yeah. that. So um, I just want to say in regards to these kind of things, I think we need to get quite granular and quite specific and have actually even exclusions apply. Um, because, you know, taking into account a lot of metrics people highly rely on, even COVID tests are highly inaccurate. Um, so yeah, that was kind well, of a, a lot of people have started cycling or running to the office and they're not going to give an accurate reading until they've called down. But I, I will just say, I don't see the other option of uh, more accurate temperature measurements to go into the office, <laughs> catching on particularly. Well, let, let's, let's bring down to Adam's case, right? So Adam, I, I think a, a better scenario that you were talking is not your hairdresser, is the passport. I think the passport yeah. and sensitive data that exists on your email and who puts it in there, who authorizes it, right? I think that's, that's a good one, right? And I, and I think we, from here we capture that, we should be talking about the legal type, the types of data you got, and actually what's the type of legal, you know, basis that exists on it, right? So, so this, is, this is one that I think is, is an interesting one to capture, right? For example, what is the type of code that exists, right? In, that is running through the, your email system, right? Whether it is proprietary, you know, available, public available open source, right? Because remember that, you know, if we talk about 10 different email systems, right? You, you can have one completely built on mm -hmm. open source that runs on an EU data center that is only stays there, right? That has a different threat profile than, for example, the ones that you talk about where you, you don't even know where your email actually stored, right? Or you, know, you might have the option to have in some cloud providers, but maybe not others, right? So I think this is a, an interesting one to capture. And, uh, and, and also, I guess more and more, the governance starts to be an, an, an interesting problem, right? Because who actually has governance, you know, how, how is the governance done over the data and access to the data? How is that actually done? 
and I think maybe having a definition of what governance means, because I think it's one of those yeah. words that everyone's got a different interpretation of. Sure. Well, absolutely. The point of each of these, you should have a definition of the interpretation, right? Or, or our definition, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Than, um, yeah. Cool. Um, so decommission, I think, is probably less relevant, right? I think on this. I, I think I think decommission is an interesting one because every comp I mean I'm sure you guys have seen the same thing. Every company you, you can ever do any work for, they, they've always got to think this is legacy, yeah. And legacy is like the ah, oh, we don't have to do anything now because it's legacy. And I kind of think legacy starts two weeks after an implementation. As soon as you need to patch it or do anything to it, yeah, it's kind of by default legacy. And I think the legacy excuse has got to go. I kind of just don't agree that. You know, stuff does get old, but there's, you know, yeah. unfortunately, if you have an old car and it falls apart, you've got to kind of, you know, do a bit of maintenance and rebuild it. Uh, I think we need to kind of get rid of the leg the legacy excuse because everybody, everybody's got it. That we talking about here? Sorry? How does that apply to the scenarios that we talk uh, about? Be, 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 because if we're talking about email systems, yeah, if you're using an old email system, it may not have all these facilities or not even have the ability to have these things. So the excuse is we've got to spend so much money that actually we can't do anything, which I guess is a kind of reasonable excuse. But actually, it's like saying I've got an old plane and it's not really air safe, but, you know, we'll keep it going. It's, it's when does that kind of excuse become, you know, actually you're not fit to trade business. You've got to find another way of doing it because most stuff now is not really that expensive for most companies, not compared to 15, 20 years ago. I guess what's interesting, right, is when you look at those two scenarios um, that even Adam, you talk about the email, the, the, the SaaS software as a service versus the infrastructure as a service, right? We, we, we probably, you know, again, sometimes you look at the end, right? The outcome, so, you know, the, your, you know, infrastructure as a service is probably a lot more risky, right? Then, the the, the, the mm. SaaS because although you might control it, some of the security patterns, the security practices, and the security things that you can do are going to be less mature if you have them or not, right? So again, you know, you might you know you, say, you set up your email securely if you know this stuff, you say it all correctly, or your you know your your data in sensitive you know your cloud environment, but you know somebody else might set up the same thing in a quite insecure state. So how yeah, it, it depends on the context. I think in a Shrems 2 context, where I'm worried about the NSA, right? They'd probably find it more difficult to walk into Amazon Center, uh, get the encryption keys, pull out my hard disk and decrypt it than they would to get data from uh, an email provider like Microsoft or, or Google. Mm -hmm. At least I have some security circles around my data that would have some supposedly some challenges so 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 do you use amazon keys just out of interest you don't have to say for real um that wouldn't help right because amazon has the, 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 the end game is their hsm which is then kind of you know you could argue is NSA, and then we're back to the patriot act of, uh, of the early 2010s but where, they still have the key right yeah. amazon still have the key absolutely absolutely yeah no matter they, what you they do. still have possession of the key yes yeah. So in terms of retention, I have a question with the decommissioning. I think in this scenario, it's more like a transferability of the data or migration of the service to another service, maybe. Is that relevant to you, yeah, Adam? That could that make yeah, sense. The, yeah. the migration might be to the bin, and in that case, it's decommissioning, yeah. but it yeah. is still a migration. Cool. So is this one the data retention? So these ideas is how long does the data last? I guess in your case, is, you know, in fact, the, the backups is an interesting one, right? Because, you know, because that data can, you know, stay there or not, right? I mean, I've been at the company for five years and my inbox is 90% full. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> probably about five and a half years. <laughs> yeah, so that's the... Uh, so this is just uh, some of the other things we talked about, right? Uh, types of collections. So this is, because this was the algorithms, right? I don't think it's relevant on this case, right? Um, no. And that's, that was, that's more like right, the type of data, which is kind of what we mentioned, right? And I, and I think this is a good one to spend some time on the threat modeling tomorrow, because I think 
that's where it gets interesting when because we, then we can follow the data and see what kind of threads you you have there and i think on this case was the use cases right that we um that we had um which i think we already defined on this so um and then yeah that's was the threads that we mitigate cool well i, I think i think that this was a first start i know adam you need to jump and I, I think i need to jump in a bit too so uh any any final comments you guys i think it's good it's, it's a really good exercise even just to think about all these things mm. yeah it's a yeah. it's a good start i think we're going to end up with a taxonomy well yeah that's well, i am i am more worried about my email than i was when i started <laughs> <laughs> yeah your haircut's saving lives absolutely and I, th I think taxonomy is kind of often where it comes down to. Yeah. I was at a kind of uh, a government meeting about a year ago talking about kind of child online harms. And I kind of, when anyone brings stuff up, I normally kind of go, what do you mean by this? Because everyone's got an interpretation of these kind of terrible things that have online, but everything is contextual. And they had no taxonomy. And I think it, it might have been Google or Facebook guy. I can't remember who it was. He, and I, he, I said to him, can you share your taxonomy? And he goes, I can't share taxonomy because that will tell you how to become an online predator. So you, you kind of have no, you, we're all talking about stuff that's not fully defined, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of very weird. Well, I, I look for me at uh, those type of meetings. So yeah, I think taxonomy could be critical yeah. here. Look, for me, the point of a label is for somebody to ask, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Like, you know, the, the, the label puts the cards down, right? Yeah. You basically yeah. say, this is... Uh, and, that, and that's hugely valuable. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's either A and B, right? And actually, the better the labeling system, the less ambiguity is, is in, the, in there, right? So you know you have a good labeling system when actually you get a, a case where you can have a, a checkbox exercise and you have a way to say yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no, mm. and you get a score in the end, right? So that's, I, I think the, the key here is to now do it in a modern way so mm. that you don't end up creating a gigantic, another, another standard that is sure. with tens of questions that are out of context, right? So context yeah. becomes key on this. Yeah. Cool. I really like the idea um, of the labels, especially the ones with like you put at the beginning of the ingredient. Yes. Um, with, uh, I, I, it, I think it would be a great world if we would have like all software labeled by that. Um, and then the user knows exactly what to pick and knows exactly what they're putting themselves into. Yes. Um, it's also a disclaimer in a way. So yeah, I, I yeah. really like that idea. So easier if there were labels on them. yeah well, you have certified a... organic software yeah. <laughs> and vegan i hope yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Peter, you have that problem now right because you you hit a github repo and you go what do you guys use what do you have you know where is it right what's the components right and and I, this is where i think that security has a big role to play because you need this to do your job Right. And unfortunately, today, until like Dave was saying, until you get regulation from the top down or like James was saying, until you get commercial pressure, right, to do this, right, the reality is most developer teams can get away with it, right, because they are rewarding for shipping stuff. Where they'll, they'll get away with it when you have got regulation as well. Just fewer of them will. Well, of course, but that's, that's where, you know, the, I think the, the mistake there is to think that regulation is the end all, right? I think. Oh, the, no, I, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Regulation and regulations. We need like, again, we need modern regulations, right? The idea that, for example, you know, ISO 27000 doesn't come with a, a graph and a set of mappings and a set of customization capabilities. So you can create almost your, your individual version of the ISO 27000 that only has the things that are relevant to you. Mm. Shows that those standards are not thinking correctly. Like, you know, Ben yeah. actually did some great job at trying to connect these things together. And again, you should be leveraging the great thinking, but but you need something that is customizable, right? If, if Petra on her team doesn't have something that is 100% relevant or 90% relevant to her and 90% relevant to the developers and in context and in, you know, re relevant to the business owners is not gonna fly, right? Because ultimately this will only work if we add value to the business, right? And, and it could be by risk reduction, but there's only so much that will take you. Right. I think the real value here is to change how the business operates, how software is developed. Right. And, and actually, ironically, 
going back to the points you made initially, Dave, this actually will accelerate software development. This would actually will make it better. This, this actually will reduce costs. So you know, I'm a big fan of good organization, good regulation, good standards actually allow you to go faster, right? Yeah, totally, totally agree. Look, look at Formula One. Yeah. They regulate it to the nth degree and they're still going faster and faster. Yeah. And it's all about standards, right? So in fact, it's all about, serv if you think about the serverless concept, right? The serverless concept is the idea that I care about a particular function or a particular behavior. I should be able to just code that bit, write that bit, and the infrastructure around me should just happen. It's the same thing here, right? You know, you, you want an environment where it's easy to measure and it's easy to understand what are, in a way, what are people doing? What is data doing? What are systems doing? You know, I have a great system here, but once I connect to that one, the whole thing goes, goes down the drain because, you know, I now inherit all these things. And I think labels, you know, and actually look at, you know, you know Shrems too, right? You have a situation where in one, in one day, you know, the risk profile of something was okay and the next day it's not okay. Why? Because one of your assumptions is now proven to be wrong. So, you know, and, and Petra goes down to the idea that a risk or a vulnerability down your graph should affect the top level mappings that you have because you have facts and you have vulnerabilities and you have assumptions that you made that once they change, your view should change, you know, for the good or for the better, right? Or, or no, for bad or, or, or good. Cool. Absolutely. Right, any final comments? I have a question, but I will leave it till Thursday. I know everyone wants to go, so I can't hold on that one. All right. Is it, is it, is it strands too related? It is just related on how do you put that in a, like, because you, you spoke about development um, teams, and so how do you put that in a development life cycle? So who's responsible for it? So is the QA team going to check on the ingredients and um, is it product manager who's gonna? Yeah, so it's, we can leave this for, for next time. Or, or maybe it should kind of go into like an ISO twenty thousand delivery model to kind of check yeah. that. <laughs> I, I, I think mean, it's I, probably closer to an ISO nine thousand one delivery model. Potentially, it's it's project management on ISO. Well, it, well, you got problem management of you in ISO twenty thousand, so you can kind of go around yeah. the full cycle of fixing. Just, it. just, just stick all of the numbers in and call it done. Or, or we could take the easy one and say, if you have developer in your title, yeah, we just kind of watch you, everything you do, and, and, and have a hammer ready in case there's a problem. Yeah, that... Why are you saying this? You know, we, I work in IT no, and security, I, 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 and they already hate us. <laughs> I, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. I, I did an ISO for a company, and they had one developer, yeah, who kind of didn't want to do any cyber training. And I kind of said to him, okay, if there's a data breach and I fill the form, I have to kind of say that you were too clever to do it, yeah. So he goes... I will do the training, but I won't watch it. I'll kind of have it on the screen. They had a problem four months later, yeah. Guess who was the cause of that problem? <laughs> I don't know if that was coincidence or his bad luck, but, you know, if there was one guy you would pick who would cause a problem, it was him, and he did. Yeah, but look, that, I was, you, you just, you know, <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head, right? Like, getting a workflow that works is the problem that the industry yeah. we haven't solved. Right? And, and Good question, though. Good question. Is, is, and, and, and I think that's what we're trying to tackle here, right? And, and that's the thing. All right. I think, Dida, I think we can end the session. <laughs> <laughs> Stopping the recording. Thank you.